In all of my years of watching movies, 2022 stood out as one of the greatest years for new releases. Seriously, there were so many incredible stories that came out. And while it's unfortunately been a slow year for this channel, this list is a chance for me to gush about the movies I didn't get to make their own review videos for. I'm Kyber Cube, join me as I narrow down my top 10 favorite movies of the year. You ready for this? Never. First up on my list is X by director Ty West. We follow a group of young cast and crew members who travel to a remote cabin in rural Texas to shoot a blue movie. Okay, not that blue movie. I mean a triple X movie. No, not that triple X movie either. To put it lightly, things don't exactly go the Zack and Miri way. As if the escalating friction between the crew members and the disapproving creepy elderly couple they're renting the property from wasn't bad enough, a mysterious killer emerges from the darkness out for blood. And what was supposed to be a sexy romp soon turns into a ferocious fight for survival. X wears its Texas Chainsaw Massacre influence on its sleeve and does a dang good job at it, even just from a visual and cinematography standpoint. You could definitely fool someone into thinking this was straight out of the 70s, but it really becomes something special when it starts to do its own thing. Exploring themes of repression, regret, our obsession with youth, and insecurities about aging. Just when I thought I knew what this film had in store, it completely subverted my expectations and provided something a lot deeper than your run-of-the-mill slasher. It goes out of its way to play with what audiences have been conditioned to expect from horror archetypes, and how sexuality is often portrayed in these movies. These characters are not two-dimensional, arrogant d-bags who are just meat for the grinder. They actually feel like human beings with complex motivations. Mia Goth and Jenna Ortega were pretty much the queens of horror in 2022, and they steal the show with some of the most compelling slasher performances I've ever seen. They should change the title of this movie, because X is a W in my books. Nope joins Jordan Peele's growing filmography of thought-provoking horror, providing both out-of-this-world scares and a deeper message about exploitation within the entertainment industry. At its core, the movie examines man's ongoing desire to tame mother nature, to control what was never meant to be controlled for the sake of profit and fame. Peele pulls back the curtain, or, or should I say, Jordan peels back the curtain because his name is Jordan Peel and Jordan peels back the curtain. It's it's actually a very clever wordplay. Thank you very much. Peel pulls back the curtain to really show us the abusive, unethical practices happening behind the scenes that produce so much of the entertainment we consume. Our lead characters, who have spent their entire lives in show business, are a reflection of our own self-indulgent, pop culture-obsessed selves. And their goals aren't heroic or virtuous. To paraphrase the immortal words of the Total Drama Island theme song, they want to be famous. They want to openly provoke and control the beast to turn something dangerous into a spectacle. And speaking of the beast, there's something so intimate and primal about the fear of the unknown, in this case the ultimate unknown of extraterrestrial life. I am just in awe of how they brought back the iconic old school flying saucer with that sleek minimalist design and through cinematography, visual effects, and sound managed to make it so deeply terrifying. 
Even though you don't always see it, you always feel it looming in the distance, watching. Nowhere feels safe, and wide open spaces start feeling claustrophobic. I do have my issues with Nope. Namely, they spent so long talking about that SNL sketch, but they never show it. I just want to see a glimpse. Also, hashtag justice for Gordy. That's the cutest f***ing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But it's always a joy to see how Jordan Peele plays with the horror genre beyond the surface level. And with strong, memorable imagery and larger-than-life set pieces, Nope is certified dope. <laughs> Top Gun Maverick may have been delayed more years than Tom Cruise has rows of teeth, but it's one of those sequels that adheres to what made the first installment so great yet still zooms past and overtakes it in every way. The flight scenes are incredibly fast yet easy to follow, the characters, both new and returning, are memorable enough, and it builds up on the emotional aftermath of the 80s classic in a very meaningful way. It sticks to the original formula very closely, even down to the gratuitous shirtless volleyball scene, but ups the ante all the way to the climax, which is the ultimate Death Star trench run with the most glorious heart-pounding aerial combat ever put to film. While this fresh-faced squadron can be a bit one-note, with new characters very blatantly filling the archetypal roles from the first Top Gun, the film makes up for it with the tense dynamic between Maverick and Miles Teller's rooster, the son of Maverick's late best friend and radar intercept officer Goose, who died while flying an operation with him. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of emotional baggage there to unpack. And we get to see both actors at the top of their game navigating this extremely volatile relationship. Top Gun Maverick is a high-flying blockbuster in every sense of the word. It soars to the top and sticks the landing. It would be hard to outdo this one. But if they ever try doing another movie featuring Rooster's son and they need another bird theme to call sign, might I suggest Little Bustard. <laughs> No one can craft tension and family drama quite like director Asghar Farhadi can, and we see him return to what he does best in his latest film, A Hero. We follow Rahim, a man on parole who gets his hands on a lost handbag full of gold coins, and despite being deep in debt, he eventually decides to return it to its owner. News spreads of his kind deed, and Rahim is like, Would you look at that? They now see me as… a hero. It's not long before holes in his story start to open up and rumors circulate about the validity of his account. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, and he and his loved ones are forced to sink to new lows, to deceive, just to prove themselves. For how he explores the dangers of the court of public opinion, and the ripple effect of the lies we tell ourselves. There's never an easy black and white choice in this film. There are very stark ethical and personal ramifications whether the characters choose to tell the absolute truth or choose to lie. And every decision accumulates to a point that it becomes a question of where you put your foot down and draw the line. It's also a film about second chances. Are people ready to accept that this man is really leaving his shady past behind, or is he really not to be trusted? With masterful dramatic performances and tension that never stops building, a hero keeps you guessing and keeps you in a chokehold until it's over. <laughs> It's always a massive undertaking for movies to continue without their stars, and we've had productions forced to deal with the tragic departures of their main actors before. But in my opinion, none has ever done it as well as Wakanda Forever has. 2018's Black Panther was a cultural touchstone, and we all felt the loss of Chadwick Boseman, but not as much as his friends and co-stars have. And to see them channel that heartbreak in this sequel is such a cathartic experience, and his legacy is never at any moment left behind or forgotten in this movie. With Wakanda still dealing with the sudden passing of their king, we get to see how different people process grief differently. Some turn to religion, some have to get away to fall apart, some continue fighting to honor what they've lost, and some bury themselves in their work. A lot of the conflict here is very much internal, but this MCU entry also introduces another mystical kingdom in the form of Talukan, with its own rich history, culture, and goals, with Wakanda being caught in the crossfire. We witness Shuri having to step up and take the reins as Black Panther, and confront her anger and guilt to learn what it truly means to become a leader. But we also get to see the same struggle with Namor, who very quickly becomes one of the most compelling antagonists we've had in the Marvel Universe. Wakanda Forever is a fittingly dark and emotional next chapter in the Black Panther story, 
And despite the cast and crew having to fight an uphill battle to carry on without their T'Challa, they created a moving tribute and satisfying sequel that doesn't disappoint. If you love The Iron Giant, How to Train Your Dragon, and Pirates of the Caribbean, or is it Caribbean? The Sea Beast takes all the best elements from those films and somehow makes them even better in one of the best looking animated films of the year. It's a crime that this movie wasn't given a wide theatrical release, because this would have been such a dazzling big screen experience. The Sea Beast is an epic high seas adventure filled with awe-inspiring visuals, breathtaking monsters, and swashbuckling action. Seriously, this is such a beautiful looking film. But I think what really captured me about this was its hard-hitting moral about revisionist history, blind faith, and truly questioning the heroes of the past. History is written by the victors, and the government and the Sea Beast have constructed a false narrative over countless generations warning about the dangers of the Sea Beasts and the desperate need to cull their kind, effectively creating propaganda to stoke fear and oppress the voiceless. The message that you can be a hero and still be wrong is explored really well here. Making your decisions based on what's laid out for you can propel you to distinguished heights and in turn give you power. But sometimes it's tougher to choose a more virtuous path. Things aren't so black and white in the real world, and the film shows us how difficult it is to leave behind everything you've believed in your whole life. And that the older you are, the more uncompromising you might be in abandoning tradition and accepting new things. The feeling of familiarity with the Sea Beast is inescapable, but it's still a dang good watch. They recently announced a sequel, and I'd be keen to sail with the crew of the inevitable again. <laughs> Ryan Johnson kills it yet again with another Benoit Blanc mystery. Glass Onion doubles down on what made Knives Out so great. The eccentric lineup of affluent suspects you love to hate, the razor sharp comedic timing, and the critique of the upper class. But there's so much that's still fresh and new. There's such an understanding and a reverence for the Agatha Christie whodunit formula that it knows when to embrace the tropes and when to just go crazy. Foreshadowing is one of Johnson's favorite storytelling tools, and here it forces you to lean in and pay attention to every detail and clue. Every single offhand line of dialogue, prop, even the blocking of each scene is purposefully laid out to be scrutinized. Just like the title implies, we're dealing with something extremely layered yet completely transparent. Everything is in front of you to examine, to keep you on your toes and question what exactly is being presented. And just when you think you got a handle on what's going on, it pulls the rug out from under you with reveal after reveal. The actors are clearly having a killer time with the material. And while it's a smaller ensemble than the previous film, this gives Glass Onion a chance to go into greater detail exploring each suspect and what they stand to gain or lose from what's happening. And it's such a fun, hilarious experience too. It's so tongue-in-cheek about the 1% and celebrity culture that it's hard not to have a good time with this one. These movies have cemented Benoit Blanc into the pantheon of great big screen detectives. So it's no mystery that Glass Onion is a surefire hit. So hop onto Netflix and give it a shot. I don't think I've ever been as hyped for a boy band concert as I was when I watched Turning Red. I'm really digging how the CG animation industry has been growing out of the hyperreal and entering a more stylized and cartoony phase. And this rings true with the more exaggerated anime-inspired character designs and expressions in Domi Shi's directorial debut. This visual direction really accentuates the heightened emotions of this teenage coming-of-age comedy about growing up and the discomfort and uncertainty that comes with it. Pixar is no stranger to coming-of-age stories, and I can't blame anyone who draws a parallel between Turning Red and 2021's Luca, with both films centering on characters who have to accept this creature inside of them that was once thought to be something to be ashamed of and hidden from the outside world. Turning Red presents itself through the lens of a different cultural perspective, something Domi Shi excelled at with her short film Bao. This reflects a shift within Pixar to represent more diverse voices and stories. But we also see the animation powerhouse push themselves again to tackle a very sensitive, tab 
taboo topic of a young girl going through puberty and dealing with the changes her body experiences, both physical and emotional. Teenagers are often misunderstood and misrepresented as paper-thin stereotypes. They're caught in an everyday struggle to stand out and fit in at the same time, to both embrace their feelings and hide them. It's such a complex look at a very important stage in a person's life, the roller coaster of emotions that is adolescence. There isn't a one size fits all manual on growing up, and it can get messy. And 13 year old May discovers that the hard way when she turns into a giant red panda during periods of intense emotional states. And through many trials and tribulations, she learns to accept these new emotions instead of keeping them bottled up. Turning red represents complex themes so boldly through visual metaphors and humorous writing that it's accessible enough for viewers of any age, and hopefully opens up healthy discussions and a greater understanding between parents and children, in a way that only Pixar can. This film has stuck with me ever since I saw it, and it's never not on my mind. Oh my, oh my. I can't believe I wrote that. Hello, Pinocchio. Nose is growing a mile a minute, dude. It's been a great year for Guillermo del Toro fans. Between Cabinet of Curiosities and his long-awaited stop-motion adaptation of Pinocchio. Co-directed by Mark Gustafsson, one of the masterminds behind the California Raisins. This is a labor of love 15 years in the making and boy it's got a lot to show for it. Every single frame of this film is decked out with meticulous detail and handcrafted artistry. While audiences never go too long without a brand new Pinocchio retelling, Heck, 2022 itself brought us three of them. Del Toro is able to take this familiar fable and reimagine it in a way that makes you feel like you're experiencing it for the very first time. His signature style is infused into every facet of this film. His color palette, relatable creatures, circuses, and themes of championing the outcast. It takes some of the core messages of this story, which was for kids to do what they're told, obey their elders and follow the rules, and really dissects and deconstructs how complicated those lessons can be against the historical backdrop of fascist Italy. The world can often be a sea of countless opposing voices all screaming over the top of each other. And that can be confusing for so many people growing up. This film really talks about the importance of staying true to yourself, and that sometimes breaking the rules of society and authority is something that has to be done to fight against injustice and to save the ones you love. There are very strong parallels between Pinocchio and Frankenstein's monster. We have an inanimate object being given both the blessing and curse of life, and thrust into a world that fears and doesn't understand him. Except that in Pinocchio's case, he doesn't end up drowning a little girl that we know of. This movie isn't afraid of straying from the darker imagery and religious symbolism of the original story, but it also retains that same childlike wonder and whimsy you'd expect from a fable like this. The film also explores themes of death and mortality, but we also get a bittersweet father-son story about accepting people for what they are and not who you want them to be. Del Toro and Gustafsson approach this project with a driving philosophy of the perfection of imperfection, and the results speak for the Themselves. This is an endlessly enchanting, grim, timeless tale that's going to be carved into the hearts of a whole new generation. Pinocchio is definitely one of Del Toro's best, and I'm not lying when I say this is a must watch. Before we move on to my number one, this was one of the hardest years to narrow down my top 10 for. It pained me to leave out so many movies I loved, and I'd be remiss if I didn't cover my honorable mentions. It was such a fantastic year for the horror genre. Scream 5 lived up to the highs of the franchise, Smile was very much in the same vein as The Babadook and It Follows, using horror to explore sensitive subjects, in this case trauma and mental health. Barbarian was just an absolute whirlwind of twists and perfectly set up frights. The Bad Guys was equally sharp in the visual and writing department and had me smiling from start to finish. Rise of the TMNT had emotions that hit just as hard as the punches with some of the best 2D animated action you'll ever see. I'm also a sucker for Spider-Verse inspired visuals and Enter Galactic delivered that in spades in a psychedelic love story. Aubrey Plaza as Emily the Criminal delivers my favorite performance of hers yet in an intense crime thriller. And speaking of crime, 
Miscreants run rampant in the sleazy underbelly of Gotham in The Batman, which was such an incredible looking David Fincher inspired detective film. The Weird Al movie was the unflinchingly savage satire of biopics I never thought I needed. Prey was a fresh spin on the Predator franchise that definitely rises up to be one of the best installments yet. And Farha was a harrowing true story about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine from the perspective of a young village girl. And if you had some 2022 movie recommendations you want to shout out, leave a comment down below. And without further ado, here's my number one. Everything Everywhere All at Once boldly pushes the envelope of medium and genre as only the directing team of Daniels can. Where do I even start with this movie? Everything Everywhere pretty much skirts the line of an action-packed blockbuster and an art film. Combining off-the-wall Hong Kong-inspired fight choreography, powerful dramatic performances, crazy costume design, and some of the funniest and most insightful writing you'll ever witness in a movie. It's such a crazy cocktail of ideas, but it somehow works. A lesser team of directors would have seen this film get crushed under the weight of its own insane ambition. But Daniels pulls it off, so my hat goes off to them. We get such phenomenal performances from the cast, but another big star of this movie is the art direction used to bring all these universes to life. You might feel a bit burned out on multiverse storytelling, but this movie really takes the concept and uses it to its fullest potential to explore Evelyn's regrets and resentments. That literally every choice she's made, every time she said no instead of yes and vice versa, could have resulted in a more fulfilling life for her. And we get to explore so many outrageous ideas through these different possibilities that feel both hilarious and heartfelt. That you'll start asking yourself the question, is this movie about women with hot dog fingers and rocks with googly eyes really making me cry my eyes out right now? The chosen one plot device is also something we've seen time and time again, but everything everywhere actually presents a really funny spin on it, which is the humorously blunt point that Evelyn is the chosen one. Not because she's naturally skilled or anything, but because she has so many interests but isn't particularly good at any of them, which actually turns out to be the key to unlocking all these abilities from different universes and what-if scenarios. It's through her experience constantly daydreaming about what could have been that makes her the perfect candidate to save the multiverse. And it's such a funny approach to this story because it's so relatable. I think we've all juggled multiple hobbies and interests that we feel like we can be a jack of all trades but a master of none. And the film itself juggles so many mediums, so many vastly different universes universes and concepts, effectively pushing the multiverse angle to its breaking point without losing track of its main message. It's a story about parenthood and generational trauma, that before you accept others, you have to learn to accept yourself. To not dwell on the past, but to learn from it. Evelyn sees so much of herself in her daughter Joy, and that's what scares her. And the film acknowledges that sometimes it's easier to just give up and let go of the ones you love. But life doesn't make sense, and you fight through a great deal of suffering and heartbreak just for the little specks of time where it does make sense. There's no real answer or meaning of life, apart from what we make of it. And it's truly beautiful how well this movie captures that through all these bonkers ideas. This film is strange, it's weird, and it's proud of it. This isn't only my favorite movie of the year, but it has gone down as one of my favorite movies of all time now. I am just in awe when a project is able to come along and really challenge the medium and weave so many different ideas so perfectly. There's never been a movie quite like it. And I honestly don't think there ever will be again. And whenever I think of it, it never fails to give me goosebumps. Everything Everywhere All at Once is movie magic at its most magical. And with that, that's another wrap up video done. Wishing everyone a joyous and healthy new year. Now let's enter 2023 with open hearts and minds. Take care and God bless. And I'll probably see you next year.